Matt, thanks so much for joining us this afternoon. We always like to open up by giving you the opportunity to share about yourself and how you came to get involved with space. Yeah, no, thanks. I appreciate it to be on your uh, podcast here today and uh, excited to share about what I've been learning over the last couple of years in uh, the space industry. Um, it's definitely a growing and ever changing and expanding. And they say, uh, a lot of people say in the last five years has been some of the greatest growth in the last over 20, so um, even 50. So it's just it's the next great big space movement. Um, I feel like I've been coming and learning about this through more of the uh, commercial angle and just kind of understanding uh, the growth that's been happening uh, as more companies are getting involved. And uh, so I work with Near Space Launch and um, I, I believe one of my colleagues was able to share er earlier from an engineering perspective. And so we, we, I'm sharing more from the commercial side, just how NSL has been engaging in that in a, from government to uh, education to industry. Yeah, that's, that's true. Uh, in fact, I want to say six years ago, when I met uh, this other engineer, uh, Matt, he said, I want to say you guys had maybe 16 uh, radios or payloads on orbit. And now, are, is, am I right? Are you over 600? That is correct. Yeah, so we're over 600. We just celebrated our 100th satellite in orbit as well. Um, and so it's been a very busy five, six years for the team. And I'm uh, thankful that I could just be a part of that in a little way. So it's been yeah. fantastic. And are we still batting 100%? Because I know you guys were really proud that your radios always turn on. Is that, are we yeah. still batting 100%? So the iStars are, yeah, for our commercial and industry partners, they're all been 100% there. And we've gotten a lot of um, the iStar radios, they have a good throughput as always, even if there's a high spin ratio. So, yep. Yeah. Uh, would you share from your seat what your job is like and what you've been tasked with at your space launch? And if you'd like, you're welcome to speak about how you see the industry maybe morphing or uh, evolving in the next few years. Yeah, uh, so I'm the chief operating officer in your space. Uh, so it's a pretty wide thing for a small company. Um, and so it makes it really interesting and fun. Uh, but one of my goals is just kind of look at the future developments of space and also see how can our company fit into that. Um, and so one of the things that we do and kind of focus is on is how to help people get to space for the first time, uh, no matter where your background is. And so we grew out of a university at Taylor University about six years ago. Um, and two professors helped found it, and we were uh, trying to get ourselves into space for the first time. And so our, our team was gifted with a really gifted engineer that was able to build his own satellite and then uh, found that he was uh, able to do that, and we were able to expand that to other people. So um, as this market is growing quickly, a lot of people are trying to figure out, how can I get to space? And we've kind of walked through uh, that process a lot of times now, like you were sharing with the 600 systems in space, um, it's quite the blessing to be able to have that. And that's partnering with a lot of great people uh, by working with a lot of different people, learning how they do it, uh, and uh, hopefully sharing that with the next group. Um, how can we help them get to space? Absolutely. You know, earlier you had mentioned that you actually got to space in a different way. Most people think you go in for aerospace engineering, but you said something about an MBA. Can you kind of explain maybe for our listeners how somebody who comes from a different background can actually find a job in this career field? Yeah, it is, it's definitely a switch of uh, directions. Um, I was helping with uh, international uh, uh, business before this, and um, I have a family that's been very involved in this, so I wanted to, um, and that's really helped me grow into it. And then also being around, surrounded by some great engineers uh, the last couple of years, uh, they've been drinking from the fire hose for me. Um, but there's some, there's definitely crossover in business when you go from industry to industry, um, and you kind of recognizing markets and trying to learn how that works. Um, one of the recommendations, though, is really try to figure out the big pipeline of how this uh, all comes together. And that's kind of been learning from the top to the bottom and just uh, self-educating over and over. So I enjoy learning and challenges, and there's plenty of that here in space. Um, so I think uh, a recommendation is uh, get yourself surrounded by people that are very knowledgeable and uh, pick their brains a lot and try to learn from them. And uh, thankfully our team has, our founders have 70 years of experience in the space industry. Um, and so it's been a rapid growing and then also working with a lot of great partners, um, get to see how they do it and then um, move, help move other people forward that way too. So. Yeah, I, I personally have lived that, right? You guys, yeah. I am your first time customer. I am the mm -hmm. prototype of a newbie who you mm -hmm. guys six years ago uh, just, I have so much positive things to say. You know, I literally have taken kids to Upton, Indiana, which is a hole in the cornfields. I mean, it's tiny, That's right. right? That's and, right. Uh, 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 
let me ask this. Did you attend Taylor University? Uh, or did I did, you? yes. Yeah, I, would I went to Taylor University there in the small college. So it's a university of about 2,000. Um, they have a strong engineering department and business department. Um, and so I graduated, I left, I lived in overseas for a little while and then Colorado and then moved back to Indiana. Um, and so it's been a pleasure to be back here and actually uh, we're expanding uh, as a startup, you know, most of these tech companies start in a garage and um, one of our exciting things is we're actually expanding into a new fulfill uh, fulfillment center. Uh, so that's one of my required our jobs is to help look at expansion and uh, building our team. Uh, so we're expanding our team currently um, and just how can we start manufacturing these satellites in the Midwest in Indiana. Uh, and so a lot of times uh, our colleagues in the industry are in California or Colorado or the East Coast. So it's been a privilege to kind of represent Indiana in this uh, field um, and uh, share what we can in the small sat sector. Uh, there's a lot of other great companies in the Midwest and uh, always a pleasure to work with them. But yeah, we're, we're really excited about uh, this current next phase for NSL um, where, you know, we've taken the learnings of this heritage of 600 systems and how can we build that into a a manufacturing facility that is uh, scalable here now. So you'd mentioned that you kind of are operating from the idea of it, like the, the commercial operations. So is it part of your job then to find the clients or are you advertising for clients or do, how do they find you and like what is your role in getting them? Yeah, so I mean, I think one of the things that I do strategic partnerships uh, kind of work with a lot of different groups there. Um, I'm helping facilitate just uh, different uh, customers all the way through the pipeline, just making sure they get what they need and make sure they continue to go through what they need to uh, follow up with people and get feedback. Um, so like, you know, when someone wants to go to space, I kind of say that like there's three big avenues. Uh, you need your licensing, you need your launch provider, and you need a good satellite. Um, and so we want to make sure all those things come together with, when you work with NSL and we want to make sure you get to space. So it's not just you buy a satellite from us. We want to make sure you get the whole solution to get you up into orbit. Um, right. So I'm what, a person that would kind of help you through the whole process, uh, but yeah, also I get to work on the proposals and uh, look at how can we work in government contracting, um, working with industry partners, how can we get you flight heritage to commercial education, how can we make sure students are really learning the material and just passing on our technical things and handing the teachers what they need uh, for that next stage. And, uh, yeah, and they're, so I'm in task also. To you then is what it sounds like. So basically, you have a, a customer who already knows I got to find somebody to help me deliver this and to come all the have the pieces come together, and that's when they come and find you. That right, you're not having to look to you. Basically, are just kind of the face to say, all right, here I am. Let's let me show you how we can set this together. Yeah, like basically that's that is very true. I mean, most of it is people are coming to us. They hear about us. They know what yeah. we're doing, and then we we share the news and. Um, so I, I try to partner with people that want to share about what we're doing there. And um, yeah, it's been really a deep blessing that people keep coming back and working with us and uh, kind of expanding that way. I, I actually see you having customers at both ends, right? At one end, I see DOD and universities and schools and maybe even individuals like, like we were, we were a school. And then I see, obviously, you have a lot of interaction with probably DOD and NASA and the FCC and whatnot. So you're really working with regulatory and, and government agencies as well as a lot of different kind of customers, right? That's got to be interesting, right? Your job's probably not very boring. No, no, it's definitely been a very fun and uh, challenging job. Uh, and, and yeah, you're right about that, Kevin, just about how we have, I think we grew out of the universities. We've all taught before at different times and we all just see the importance of that and want to see the next generation, uh, which is super important to be excited about space and engineering and just what you're doing is amazing. Um, and so we love what you guys are doing and just um, supporting groups like that and how we can help with some of the technologies that we're developing here can be used in school systems. And so we're actually you know, wanting to partner with uh, any anybody that's trying to do that and help where we can. Uh, but then, yeah, on the other hand, we do have our, um, uh, DOD and NASA projects where we're doing uh, building constellations for space weather along with uh, rapid testing for Space Force prototypes. So um, we have launches that are happening every 90 days now, um, which we're excited about and uh, it keeps us busy about from schools to uh, Space Force using that service um, to kind of help get people in orbit. We had mentioned schools, and I know there's an educational component to what Near Space Launch is looking to do. How are you, are you looking to grow that educational outreach, and is it only for the universities who are looking to do it, or do you have some kind of component where you're looking to add curriculum to 
two programs? Yeah, I think our primary hope is uh, we, we do want to stretch ourselves into a nonprofit where we can work directly with other nonprofits better and other schools. And so we can have a focused uh, group as we keep expanding. I think there are two different mission statements. Um, and I think we want to do them both well. And so one is going to be hiring some more teachers to do teacher to teacher interaction or to work with other uh, groups like yourselves and uh, doing amazing work. And so we can have very focused help on that um, avenue and uh, do more collaborative work in that way. And then also kind of have another group that's kind of focusing on the DOD government side, which I think is a natural growth of a company, uh, just yeah. kind of segment itself as it grows into those areas. And, uh, right, right. Yeah, it's, I really enjoy uh, that. A diversified portfolio of customers is really optimal, right? Well, and it'd be helpful too, because like, it's difficult. I mean, I know Kevin is not like a traditional teacher. There's no doubt about that. But even when we have talked to teachers who are interested, they just don't even know where to begin. So having mm -hmm. that, um, that availability where you have some teachers who are able to work with other educators as part of your company, I, I think that's fantastic and needed. Right. I, it's needed. And I'll add the education company uh, nonprofit you spun out uh yeah. near space education is that did i get the name right near you space. got it yes that's right um one of the shining uh one of your best products i think is your high altitude balloon program because i mean uh for our listeners uh, just like three weeks ago i we, we did a balloon from tequesta and uh it went out over the atlantic and we have a buoy system that uh jeff daly one of the engineers there he, he's really sharp and Mm -hmm. We got eight days of data telemetry from the buoy that was at 92,000 feet. And then once it splashed down, we tracked it for eight days with the Global Star Network. So we're, we're big fans of the hardware. Yeah. But well, let, me pivot, uh, let me pivot a little bit from the education. I want to see how much like Elon Musk that you are. All right. So here's <laughs> oh, my, there, there's the setup. Um, I, I, think a lot of us, to that. I think a lot of us rookies, <laughs> Uh, in the space game, we look at how he vertically integrated his company, how he built so many things in-house. Would you say one of the drivers that has made NSL uh, so successful is that you build a lot of stuff in-house? Is that a fair statement? And I'll, I'll let you answer it any way you want. I would say that um, one of the way I would say it is we have a team that has enough experience to know what is the important things they need to have done and not kind of thing. So being a small team keeps you agile. So I think it's our small smallness as far as ability to move through the systems that are required to get you in orbit. Um, so just for example, you know, environmental testing to building your comm systems to uh, small satellites. So we definitely partner with launch providers. We have a great network of those. Um, and so we're not trying to build our own rockets, that's for sure. Uh, and But we do see like, you know, it helps that, um, you know, we are willing to partner with others. Integration is a complicated thing. It does slow down things. Um, but if you can find good partners where you've integrated something together, you can do that still rapidly. So sure. I think and I was thinking more about the manufacturing side, about um, I understand you build some of your own boards. You mm -hmm. you build your own EPS, um, oh, your own rate. Elon Musk. Yeah, you you build you build uh, several components of your CubeSats in house. Is that that's a correct statement? Wouldn't you say? Yeah, that is correct. Yeah, we do do deliver a lot of our own units um, as far as for the actual satellite itself, um, and that, that's our goal. Is kind of in, with educators is that you know we're asking students their first time to build the entire satellite on their own, and uh, then we're upset when something doesn't work the first time that they try to launch it. And they're not upset. I think it was, that's not the right word. But, um, you know, if we could help build a nice program where we can deliver, you know, the students, you build this part and not the entire car the first time, uh, it might be helpful. And so, yeah, we, we're excited to kind of provide that service where we have a lot of these parts made and we can keep the cost down for our, our schools um, and uh, have some of that in-house and then also control some of the, the production line process there. Sure. I, I totally agree. And I would recommend any teacher out there just focus on the payload, right? Just focus on the payload and, yeah. and get that data back with the payload. Well, that, see, I that think you start way. with the balloon. So I want to go back to the balloon thing for a second. So I think that as you start expanding your education, not that I am like an expert yeah. at all, but like no, the balloon please. part is way more accessible, you know, yeah. to most schools. And I would imagine like, even something on a smaller scale, like if you're taking it into the classroom, even lessons along with that. So I don't know how low you're looking to go with your, your curriculum yeah. um, and the teaching uh, realm with that, but the high altitude balloons is a perfect segue into some of those larger items. And I, I 100% agree with you. Yeah, yeah no, we, that's great. And then, go ahead, Ken. 
I was just going to say, uh, work on the bench, tethered balloon, high altitude balloon, and go to space. I feel like that's a good, you know, if you could do captive carry flights or suborbital flights, great, but why not just go to space? You know what? Yeah. I think the high altitude balloon is a great segue to low earth orbit. Yeah, and I think you're both exactly right. I think making space accessible, I think about 20 years ago, um, Bob Twiggs and, uh, um, and others uh, co-founded or really created the CubeSat. I mean, the CubeSat is what we like to talk about a lot for the schools and learning and how to build. And that was actually designed as a school learning mechanism. And you might have talked about some of this before, uh, but just... Uh, that has kind of gotten expensive over the years and more complicated as technology gets, you know, can put more into a CubeSat, more expectations are coming from it and commercials getting involved and uh, from NASA and Space Force about what can we provide out of these small sats. And uh, it's kind of scaled out of the price range for a lot of um, educators at first. And so, but yet that's still the entry point for schools a lot of times. And that's a hard barrier to get into. And so, yeah, I think a great way to kind of start is balloons and maybe even a smaller sat, like a thin sat where that's something that we've started manufacturing. And, you know, we kind of in our mind there's four steps to kind of steps to space. One is why not learn how to work on, make a payload and develop that board very similar to robotics clubs. You know, why can't we do a transferable skill from that and then maybe do a flight on a balloon, track it like you, Kevin you and your team did there and see it go across the ocean and uh, see the altitude, the, the top, top one or 2% of the atmosphere and then um, then move on to a thin sat, which is like a shared group of satellites and then go into a, an actual full on CubeSat. Um, you know, and people could jump wherever they feel comfortable at and go into it, but at least, you know, make those barriers a little bit easier for schools to jump on board um for the space learning and um, yes. yeah and that uh, bob twigs was a big fan of that how can that, that's the idea is how can we make space right. for everybody uh matt uh, share with our audience a little bit more about the thinsat program because they may have heard us talk about cubesats almost every week but thinsat is uh even even more novel or unique than the cubesat so how about share just uh, about the program and i believe it resides at nsl that's an nsl product correct you're the only provider of the thin set? Uh, we are the only provider of thin set. There's some flat sets out there now, and I think it's catching on, uh, which we're thankful for. Um, we worked with Virginia Space and Twig Space Labs. So Bob Twigs was that with this whole passion of CubeSats. He was like, how can we go back to schools? And so we designed and we're asked to design some sort of uh, lower cost manufactured uh, satellite that you know these schools could use. And so back in 2019, we delivered uh, 60 thin sats, uh, which is basically if you take a 3U cube sat, which is like a loaf of bread, you know, and we slice it up and make it into 21 unique small satellites. So um, that way you can still put your payload in there, but we still provide you with a, a small satellite uh, for each school and they can uh, get that flown. And so it shares the launch costs, it shares the satellite building, and we were able to robotically make those thin sats. So that we made 100 of them. And so the schools were responsible for making the payload area only. They could make their own payload or they could take one of our boards and populate it with something already that was space qualified and put that into orbit. So that was launched in 2019 and 52 of the 60 started talking to us. And it was only a 10 day mission, uh, but it was perfect for schools to do some data analysis, kind of have that. And then we launched another 30 in 2021 here, I think. So what, what do you um, say to those that would say, well, you're putting a lot of trash up in space. How would you answer those that say you're contributing to the debris problem? That's, yeah, a, that's yeah. a cupcake right there. That's a softball. I threw you a softball. No, no. I mean, that's a great question. I mean, I, you definitely want to be careful of how we're putting those in orbit. And uh, so, I mean, we're very concerned with that. And I can talk about our black box too, how we're trying to help with that problem. Um, because I think it, conjunctions are going to become bigger, a bigger issue for our future in space, uh, especially if things get... Uh, keep going the way they are but uh, yeah as far as for the thin sats we have those uh, the last couple they get launched and they're pretty small so they're a little harder to track but we were able to put beacons on them for one way so people will can actually uh, track them based off the global star or kind of a satellite to satellite communication system um, and then also the, the missions that we did for schools were very short missions so if they were 10 days you know they get you know only a couple passes there and then they burn up and so they burn up in the atmosphere and we make sure that all of our systems do that um that they uh, have a, a really good uh, timeline and you know it was really neat though is like those because it was in the lower atmosphere not many satellites are designed for that so we were able to study uh, the very low earth orbit so it's leo you know low, low earth orbit so we got the very low and our radios were able to communicate um, and gather some really fascinating data and the students had a really meaningful 
um, launch for that as well because yeah, uh, so that, there's a lot of space that, weather in that area. Right, that would be like the lower mesosphere and yeah, the lower mesosphere, right? So way yeah. underneath the space station. So I think it's great cool. that you're allowing them the option, okay, build your own if you're here at this level, you know, you're advanced here, but that you have something available for those who just want to actually get their hands just beginning. So that's fantastic. They can pick from a couple of choices. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was quite the range. I mean, we had a range from middle schools taking and pre-programming some of the boards that were kind of pretty straightforward, like very straightforward teaching kind of thing. You had to have some great teachers involved. Um, and then we had from, you know, NASA to AFRL, uh, Air, Air, Air Force Research Labs, you know, making some of their own satellites and having some more complicated issues building in and also using it as a test platform to test out some things in space and see how it would react. So, it, I mean, it has a quite a variety of ability with that. And um, we're actually using that same process that we use for schools and now have uh, been awarded two contracts, one with Space Force and one with NASA to use that and scale it a little bit larger for space weather studies uh, for NASA and then also rapid testing for Space Force products. So will you be building all of those satellites in-house or is that sort of like the schools will get to do that again? It's not an educational, this is a, a flat out just a defense contract, right? Yeah, or so those, one were, those are going to be commercially built and uh, separately it. launched. Um, but it's the same principle of idea, but we're going to yeah, have a little more rigidity to it there. But yeah, so it's... must your thin sets always or it, are they able to be deployed from any vehicle just like a CubeSat or do they have to be kicked out of the ISS? What, what is your uh, launch preferences for deployment of your thin set constellations? Yeah, so our, our goal was to kind of keep it within the current model that's out there. So we didn't want to invent something that would not be quickly adapted. Um, so it actually fits in all the CubeSat launchers. Um, and so that was kind of our goal is to kind of currently it started with planetary systems and now we've designed our Gen 2 to fit within the standard other launchers, which they call like the from the Peapod to um, Nanorax launchers, a lot of the other standard ones. So our first generation was specifically to one kind of type of launcher, but the same ones the CubeSats use. So, right, right. So, in theory, we actually had a mission manifested that launched some thin sets and some cube sets in the same launch. So, that was kind uh, of a, a, neat, a neat design there. Could, could you put a, I guess you always load 21 into a 3U. Is that correct? You'd never put like a 1U and then a 7 and a thin set. Or is that, is that possible too? No, and I mean, you're right. So, the first two missions that we did had 21 if it was a 3U version. Uh, but this newer version, we've made them a little bit larger and a little more capabilities in them. And so now they're about 18 per 3U launcher. Yeah. But you could still launch, let's just say, six or so thin sets and then two one use. You know, so like, yeah. so yeah. it's kind of some neat, neat variations that we can do there. Um, so so uh, for, for a visual for our listeners, the thin set uh, deploys once it, uh, I'm sorry, it, uh, it unfolds once it's deployed. Is that correct? And, yeah. and it has a common sort of uh, power bus, I guess, or solar panels. Could you describe that a little bit? Yeah, so the easiest way to think of that, if you kind of think of a uh, loaf of bread, uh, as Bob Twigs calls it, and you slice each one up there, that's each of those slices would be a thin sat. So they're all kind of squished together. And then when you launch it, they kind of fan fold out and kind of become a nice level playing field. And each one of these slices have attached to it a little uh, articulating fan fold, we call that. And it pulls out the solar cells and it gives a little trail of solar cells. So you can actually, they lock in. Um, and so you kind of get a nice string of solar cells. So it gives additional power to your thin sat as it goes about in orbit. So um, that's the best way I could describe it without having some visuals on hand. Oh, uh, or a little, a little sketchbook here for you guys. Yeah. But uh, that's what so, I got here for you. But does the shape that you guys came up with, does that increase the drag to shorten the life? Uh, yeah. are these, these vehicles have a lot of drag, so they and they're low. So that's very cool. Uh, quickly, uh, as we're getting closer to the end, I uh, want to ask one more uh, question. The future of CubeSats and the future of near space launch. Uh, either, both, your call. 
Yeah, as far as the future of CubeSats in space, kind of what we think is going to happen with them, um, I think it's being adopted by more and more people. Uh, it's definitely a growing industry. I mean, the projections for small sats are just keep going up and up. Uh, I think you'll get a quite a variety of options for them. Um, I don't think it's going away. I think thin sats could take off as well as uh, another option for people. And it's, it's just, it becomes, I think you'll see some variation, not just thin sats, there's these pocket cubes, there's other things that people are coming up with. Um, as long as it stays within the rules of space and um, has some good ways to deorbit and has good plans to keep people safe. Uh, we'll have a lot more neat ideas out there, uh, which I think is really cool. Right. Um, yeah, and as far as for near space launch, we're excited. We're, I mean, we're moving into larger fulfillment centers. Uh, we're expanding our team. Um, we're expanding into our nonprofit as well and hiring people for that and uh, partnering with some great people like you all and others. Um, and so we, we're excited about the future of space. I think there's a lot more people getting involved. And so hopefully there's more people we can help uh, get them involved in space and not and make that too much of a hurdle. Right, right. And and I'll just brag on you guys a minute. You, you're an American success story. Tiny American company started in the true heartland of America in the middle of the cornfield. And you, you have such a reach to space. You've impacted, you know, uh, hundreds of clients. Uh, I, I am, I'm just your biggest fan. Right, your biggest yeah. fan. So he, he might well be. He talks about you guys all the time. It's not <laughs> well, like we, talk, we appreciate you guys. No, he wears um, it all the time, like everywhere. It's not like for this. He's always wearing but, it. But um, well, we need to get you more than one then. So we'll work on doing that. <laughs> there you go. Well, we'll send you guys one there. You, you, you so. guys, you know, literally, you guys are the reason that I got middle school kids. So what you don't know is the very first kids on the keep that team, they're in college now, they're freshmen. There's wow. a couple of them are aerospace engineering students. One is a physics student at Chapel Hill. One's at uh, UF and UCF. The one at UF is doing aero engineering and astrophysics. And we have wow. one kid who's in law school already who got his high school diploma and his college degree at the same time. So wow. that's some of that first bunch of kids that were inspired in large part with some of the work that, I mean, it's all because wow. we had we're, we're, access we're, we're, we had access to tech that let the kids do what they could, but they weren't hindered with knowing how to build their own printed circuit boards and, and, and all of that. So thank you. And, uh, you know, we, we love you guys. Well, so this is an well, easy I'll definitely interview. say, uh, let me just say before we close here as well, though, I mean, we, we've worked with a lot of different teachers and we definitely recognize it's, it takes a very unique skill to bring, you know, students at that age and a teacher that really is the passion to do that. And so, especially as we're learning and how, how to help teachers, you, you all have helped guided us to learn how can we work with uh, teachers and bring the success. And uh, it'll be neat to see where your students go in the future. And, uh, you know, uh, just as uh, sharing um, about that, uh, uh, our founders, uh, Hank and Jeff, they worked with students over 20 years, um, and it's really fun to see them at the small set symposium or other places, and you start gathering them through the years, and I think that's going to be a lot of your story, uh, as you guys have helped so many students uh, kind of go into space and uh, kind of see where they scatter about and start their own enterprises. No, well, so, we really thank you. you so much for spending your time. I normally say, like, end with some advice for teachers, but you literally just did that, so that would... Um, I guess it's just really encouraging to know that for those who have been intimidated by the process that they can reach out or that there will be material available coming for them. Uh, any, anything else? Uh, you want to say we'll just make sure out? that we put your links on the, yeah, we'll put the, uh, we'll make sure all your websites are there. Nearspacelaunch.com, right? Or, uh, nearspace, yeah, launch, right. one word. Yeah. 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 All right. And uh, I look forward to seeing you guys live, real and in person, hopefully at small set or maybe even sooner. Mm -hmm. uh, That's right. Thank you so much, Matt. We appreciate, appreciate you being with us today. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys too. Thanks for letting me be with you all.